point as well. Uh, so why is this topic so important? So, uh, you know, mental health is seen differently from uh, physical illness or physical health in our community and in our culture. Uh, the this, the uh, prevalence of mental health is not something... Uh, uh, you know, it, there is a lot of uh, prevalence of mental health and mental health issues in our community and, uh, uh, and, and from our culture, there's a, there is a significant uh, portion of the culture that, that does have mental illness like any other culture, but um, it's uh, fewer people or fewer, a fewer percentage of people from our communities go to um, uh, seek this, this, uh, uh, this help. So today uh, we're going to... Uh, we have two distinguished speakers with us today, uh, Sayyid uh, Hassan al-Qazwini, Samah Sayyid Hassan al-Qazwini, who is uh, the imam, of course, of uh, the, uh, the institute here, and uh, you know, he doesn't need an introduction to Sayyid, but he's also been here, uh, you know, an, um, a visionary leader in the community for, for 25 years. Uh, he's, uh, you know, a, a, an important part of his work is empowering the youth and, and you know, with programs like these, and uh, so it's an honor to have you with us, Sayyidna. And then we have uh, Sister Malak Birro with us as well. Uh, Sister Malak is a uh, licensed clinical therapist with, with, with over 13 years of experience. She has worked in hospitals and clinics and uh, currently runs her private practice called uh, Internal Healing Services. Sister Malak has experience working with a diverse population during her time in California and has now returned to her hometown to do outreach and, uh, and help the community. Uh, she specializes in depression, anxiety, and family conflict. Thank you for being with us today, Sister Merlach. Uh, so if we can start with, uh, uh, with you, Sayyidna, for, um, uh, for your introduction about the topic. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is uh, such honor for me to be speaking to you to such distinguished group of uh, brothers and sisters uh, during one of those Friday night sessions, uh, along with a dear and respected sister, uh, Sister Malak Burro, and uh, with the uh, a gracious introduction uh, given by our dear brother Sayyid Ahmed Al Musawi. We're going to talk about the stigma tonight uh, uh, for a few minutes uh, from a religious perspective. There is a hadith that says, لا حياء في الدين. When it comes to religious issues, there should be no room for uh, stigma or عيب or uh, giving up to any taboo, meaning Islamically, uh, if we want to know our rights, our responsibilities, our Islamic laws, we should not hide behind any pretext, be it uh, cultural uh, uh, barrier or any other barrier that we make up. So, one of the issues that we always deal with in our community is the word Aib, Aib. Now, I do understand how profound Aib is in our community. And I'm not here to encourage anybody to commit anything Aib. But we're here to differentiate between what is really Aib and Haram and what is not really Aib rather than it is uh, uh, something that we made up to be aib and stigma. So, one of those issues that we always deal is, for example, is the issue with uh, mental health issues. People who need to see uh, and seek psychiatric and psychological therapy Sometimes they are afraid to do so because they are afraid, they fear that they could be accused of be doing something, you know, I, uh, they could be seen as not normal people, crazy people, uh, and that is a big problem that inhibits many people from seeking 
uh, the right to treatment. In fact, uh, one of the issues, and I'm going to go back to it, that I deal as a religious leader constantly with is people coming to me with mental issues seeking spiritual treatment. And I always tell them, look, when your stomach hurts and you have an ulcer in your stomach, you don't come to me. Do you come to me? They said, no. They say, no, we go to the doctor. I said, how come now you come to me? They say, because we believe in the power of dua and a prayer. I said, okay, but when you had a problem with your ulcer and stomach, you didn't believe in the power of dua. You went to the doctor. That's what you did. The power of dua doesn't mean you don't seek the appropriate venue of treating your problem. And this is where the confusion comes from. If God is in charge, and then he can heal me. Yeah, Allah can heal you, not only when you are, uh, uh, you are experiencing mental issues, even physical issues. Allah can heal you. Allah is the healer. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created those channels and venues for us to go through. Musa alayhi salam, the hadith says, Musa, Prophet Musa got sick. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him what's going on. قَالَ رَبِّي إِنِّي مَرِضْتُ وَإِنِّي لَنْ أَذْهَبَ حَتَّى تَشْفِيَنِي I'm not going to seek any treatment until you heal me. Allah says to him, إِنِّي لَنْ أَشْفِيَكَ حَتَّى تَذْهَبَ إِلَى الْمَرِيضِ إِلَى الطَّبِيبِ I'm not going to heal you until you go to the doctor. So those are natural venues Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created in our life. Doctors, medical treatment, medicine. He is the ultimate healer, but we have to go through those channels. He wants us to do that. So just as when I get sick in my stomach, and my bladder, I go and seek a specialist, when I have a mental issue, when I have depression, or CD, polar, bipolar, I need to go and see a doctor who will treat me. I'm not obviously a specialist, but they tell you depression is caused by triggers that can cause imbalance in your brain chemicals. So what the therapy does, it brings the balance to your brain chemicals. So it is very similar to the same process when the medicine brings balance to your stomach after having ulcer. With the same concept, we can apply it to depression. That yes, if you take this medicine, this medicine will help uh, to bring the balance back and fix your imbalance in chemical. And uh, the same concept. Now... The problem is, in our community, if you tell someone to seek medical treatment for their uh, mental illness, the first thing they will tell you, no, 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 I'm afraid people will say I'm crazy. That is the problem we have to tackle. If you seek medical treatment because of your depression, because of your OCD, you're not a crazy person. You're not a crazy, you're patient, you're ill. You need help. Go and seek help. Does that make you a less religious person? No. This, with the same concept that when I have an issue with my stomach, I go to the doctor and that doesn't make me less religious. If I seek medical treatment for my stomach, the same concept says, go to the doctor and seek medical treatment for your met mental illness. And you're not going to be less uh, religious. Some people say, no, no, good people, al-mu'mineen, the true believers, they never experience uh, depression. Who told you so? Who told you so? In fact, I, have, I 
personally know many religious people who have been prone to mental illnesses, to depression and other illnesses, mental illnesses. Mental illness has nothing to do with you being religious or non-religious. Just like any other illness, like diabetes. Diabetes strikes people whether they are religious or not. Same thing could be said about depression, OCD, and other mental illnesses. So I hope one thing we learn and one message we carry with us today after this session that ya jama'a, ya ikhwan, ya akhawat, if you see someone suffering from depression, don't send him to Islamic Institute of America. Don't send him to Islamic Center of America. Don't send him to the Majma. Don't send him to the council, Islamic Council. Send him to one of those specialists, doctors, licensed doctors, whether psychiatrists or psychologists who are licensed, who are qualified to treat those illnesses, and as a supplement, you pray for them, to, for them to, to heal. But to tell them, go to that sheikh or to that sayyid, and he will write you a piece of dua, I think you will be misleading them. Dua is good, but medication and therapy is very important as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sayyidna. <clears throat> uh, Sister Malak, if you want to give your introduction. This also needs some therapy, the microphone. <laughs> Probably. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, thank you, Brother Ahmed, for the introduction, and thank you, Sayyid. Uh, welcome, everyone. Again, my name is Malak, and I'm very happy to be here today because uh, this subject is very important to me. I mean, I do this for a living, but also to see a lot of people in our community suffering from mental health and not seeking the treatment they need because of certain stigmas or fears that they have then um, this bothers me a lot. So I'm glad we're having this conversation today. So just to kind of piggyback on what the Sayyid was saying, I'm, gonna, I'm going to cover two top two points. The first one is um, you know, kind of what the Sayyid says. What would people say? Uh, why do we have such a harsh um, stigma on mental health and we view ourselves so harshly if we do need the help? And the second part I want to discuss is, um, which I feel like is even a bigger issue, is just being mis un misinformed and uneducated on what mental health actually is. Because if we don't understand something, it's a natural human instinct to try to connect the dots ourselves. And when we don't have the information or the resources, unfortunately, we come up with our own um, solution or our own ideas. And most of the time, those ideas are false. So I want to kind of dive into those two things um, today. So. It's, is my voice supposed to echo like that? I okay. think it's fine, yeah. Sorry, I'm not used to microphones. So uh, the first part is, what will people say? Like the Sayyid said, we do think automatically that if you're going to see seek counseling, then you're crazy, which I hate that term. Because when we say crazy, it refers to a person in a psychotic state. So if you're in a state of psychosis, you actually won't benefit from therapy. What you need is to go to a hospital. But people who benefit from therapy are people that are suffering from severe anxiety, for example. Uh, from depression, um, OCD, like the Sayyid said, um, social phobias. These are reasons to seek counseling. But people automatically assume that if you seek help, then it's a weakness. Parents also make it about them. Like I have um, some young adults in my uh, practice that will tell me, when I told my mom I was coming to therapy, she started crying and saying, why, what did I do? And it's, it's not about you. It's not about what you did. It's not about the, what the father did. It's, um, you know, we're taking away from that child and we're giving them um, shame, right? Then the child carries this shame that they are coming to see me because of something their parents did, which is not true. So we make it about us or we call them crazy. Or another thing is we tend to catastrophize the issue. Like, for example, if, I'm tell if somebody's telling me about a problem they're having with their child or their spouse or their mom, and I say, why don't you go seek counseling? automatically they'll say something like, oh, but it's not that big of a deal. 
But why does it have to be a big deal to go get help? Why does it have to be a life or death situation? Why do we always think in black and white? Like Sayyid said, we assume if you're religious, then you shouldn't have depression. Again, why is it black and white? Why two things can be true. I can have complete tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I can also be sad. I mean, this is something I, I can't help. So I want us to kind of steer away from this black and white thinking. And then the second point about, um, you know, uneducated about mental health and misinformed. Uh, most of us are children of immigrants, right? Our parents are either immigrants or we are immigrants. So we are not raised talking about feelings. You know, big, major feelings are taboo. Or it's not something we've practiced. This behavior hasn't been modeled. Like our parents don't walk around saying, I'm sad, I'm hurt, I'm upset. Like these things aren't things we're used to hearing and our parents aren't used to hearing. I know from my own parents, um, that they used to maybe get a little overwhelmed if we talked about how sad we were or how anxious we were. They don't know how to handle this situation. Uh, so let me give you guys an example. Let's say Ali goes to his parents and says, um, Ali is about 18 years old and he announces to his parents that he's feeling um, overwhelmed with college. Unmotivated, this, these are the things I hear. Unmotivated, feels isolated, can't connect with his friends anymore and he doesn't know what to do. So the parents, because they're shocked by this and they're overwhelmed by what you know, Ali is saying, their automatic response is to dismiss these feelings. No, ma'ishbakshi, right? You're fine, it'll be okay, everybody goes through this, look how lucky you are, look at everything I've done for you, right? Again, we make it about us when it's really not. And we dismiss what Ali is telling us. So what we're doing here, unfortunately, and I know it's not vindictive and on purpose, but we're creating an environment that is telling your child, if you are feeling this way, it's too much for me, don't come tell me, I can't handle it, right? So the child learns, okay, I just overwhelmed my mom and dad with this information, they told me to get over it, so obviously my feelings are too much. So you're denying them their feelings, you're denying them their wants and their needs, and you're teaching them that what they're feeling is too much. We need to learn how to create an environment, a safe environment for our children, even for our friends, even for our spouses, to come to us with how they feel without getting this negative reaction or shame as to, what they're, as to why they're feeling this way. And then to take it further is, um, I know for myself, I have, I'm one of five, and you know, growing up, your parents have a lot going on, you know, work and the house and taking care of the kids. I didn't want to burden them with what I was feeling. I didn't want them to feel bad or to make them even more upset. So I would shun what, I, what I'm feeling and shut down and internalize it. And then in return, what happens? It festers in us. And I like to use this uh, term in my, uh, in my office as like a gaping wound. So imagine you have a gaping wound of emotions and you're not treating it because you know, you've been told to just ignore it and it'll be fine. And then you decide to put a little band-aid on this big gaping wound. And sometimes the band-aid is a very horrible coping mechanism. Drugs, alcohol, weed, vaping, all these things that we think are going to help us. But it's just a little band-aid and it's a really bad band-aid, right? Because those are bad coping mechanisms. So it makes the wound worse. And then we're not even addressing the wound. The wound is getting worse and worse and maybe it's getting infected and you know, not to get all nasty, but. So you're walking around with this pain inside of you and nobody knows, you feel isolated and ashamed. So then as an adult, you grow up with no coping mechanisms. Your toolbox is empty. You know, people know that come to my office, we talk a lot about toolbox. You have to have tools in your toolbox. So if you're anxious, what tool do I use? If I'm depressed, what tool do I use? If I'm overwhelmed by an exam, what do I use then? So in order to gain this toolbox, you have to go to the right person. Like the Sayyid said, you can't go to Sayyid Hassan to get your tools. You gotta come to a professional to get your tools. Um, so this is something I would love to see more talks about, like what does it mean to create a safe space? What does it mean to seek counseling? Um, I'm not crazy, I just want somebody to talk to. I'm overwhelmed by life's issues. Life is hard. And sometimes you just need somebody to help navigate, help you navigate it. Um, so I hope I can answer those questions today. Thank you very much, Sister Malak. Uh, 
Sayyidna, if we can uh, start the questions with you. Uh, you alluded to this earlier about the word Aib, for example, uh, in, in our culture, and Sister Malak also alluded to the shame that can be involved in someone seeking therapy. So, uh, you know, from, from our point of view, that can, be, they can, that can even affect how, uh, how they recover or how they're treated from, uh, from, from their illnesses if they believe that, you know, they internalize the shame to such a degree. Uh, so how can we uh, how can we balance culture and religion? How can we balance uh, uh, and, and is what's culturally inappropriate is that necessarily also haram religiously? Well, uh, we always need to differentiate between what is cultural and what is religious. Uh, what is religious is sacred. What is cultural is not sacred. Meaning. What religious says is something that we take wholeheartedly to our heart and apply in our life. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that drinking is haram, period, I need to take that seriously and I cannot mess up with that. When our scholars say that using drugs addictive drugs is haram, I need to take it and wholeheartedly and I cannot mess up around it and I cannot justify going against it. That's one thing. But the cultural is not sacred. It's a tradition. Certain people decided to uphold those traditions. The sky will not fall on earth if someone doesn't follow that tradition. Number two, Religious, what is religious is perpetual, it's permanent, it's not variable. Mm -hmm. But what is cultural is variable, it changes from time to time. So what is haram remains haram. Today, yesterday, today and tomorrow. Drinking alcohol is haram. It was haram and it is haram now and it will forever stay haram. But what is cultural is not like that. What is seen as acceptable culturally in America might not be seen as acceptable culturally in Lebanon and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So time and geography plays a major role in what is cultural. What certain cultures accept, maybe other cultures reject. Imam Ali السلام, has a very beautiful statement he made about our cultures. He speaks to the parent. He says, لا تقصروا أبناءكم على عاداتكم فقد خلقوا لزمان غير زمانكم. Do not coerce your children on your traditions, the same traditions I was raised up with because my children are born for a time different than mine, where the culture changes, progresses. What was acceptable 50 years ago might not be acceptable today. So I should not take culture and cultural issues as sacred as what religion says. Cultural issues vary from time to time, from people to people. And we should not be very strict about them. We have to be very open-minded about our cultural issues. And we should not be very strict about applying them. Because if I don't apply my culture, uh, I mean, uh, there is no harm coming from not applying the culture. Unlike if I don't follow my religion, there could be severe consequences. So we always need to distinguish between what is cultural, what is religious. With cultural issues, we have a huge room to maneuver. But with religion, no, we can't. And the problem is sometime in our community, People take what is cultural as more important to them than what is religious. Mm -hmm. And that's a big mistake. Big mistake. When a friend of mine came to me complaining that his daughter, his white daughter, 
fell in love with a black person, <clears throat> he was extremely disturbed. He was extremely disturbed. And then when I inquired on why he is so disturbed, is it because the uh, man is non-Muslim? He says, no, it's not because he is non-Muslim. Because he's black, my people will not accept him. To this guy, what is culturally not acceptable comes and trumpets what is Islamically not acceptable. His problem is not why she is marrying a non-Muslim. That's his last concern. His issue was why my daughter is marrying a black person, which shows how sometimes how racist we are. So, to this guy, being racist is, is normal. It is normal in some community to be racist. Not to like people from beyond my ethnic group. Very normal. While I see the problem is when we take a blind eye on what is religious. Because to me, what is really binding and what sets the, the line between right and wrong is not my culture, rather than my religion. Because remember, my dear brothers and sisters, if you translate religion into technical terms, religion is nothing other than morality. Religions teach you how to be more a moral person. The Prophet says, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ why you see there is a problem in this country? Even though this country is supposed to be uh, predominantly Christian, but is what they are being, what they are practicing in this society has anything to do with the Christianity? Christianity doesn't condone homosexuality. While homosexuality is being practiced, promoted, and looked upon with a positive eye. But if we follow religions, all the religions of God, the Christianity, Judaism, Islam, they all prohibit homosexuality. So we always need to differentiate between the two. We shouldn't be panicking and breaking some cultural rules if it's required, if it needs to be. But we need to be careful not to uh, step over any religious moral boundaries. <clears throat> Sister Malak, uh, so uh, there's a lot of misconception about the therapy process, right? So, uh, you know, there's uh, people who think, you know, why do I need therapy? Therapy is just kind of like venting, you know, basically you can talk to a friend if you have anything, a severe illness, you can talk to a friend and it's like venting to them and why should I go to, to a professional? So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what, what you've experienced with uh, uh, you know, with your clients, maybe some examples, uh, as well as the therapeutic process, and you know, in general, in terms of um, how much will parents know or, or confidentiality, you know, that that kind of thing. If you see clients in public, how do you, uh, you know, do you approach them or that that kind of thing? So, just tell us a little bit about that, please. So, in my um, practice, I mainly see the most I see are people having issues with anxiety, unfortunately. So I see a lot of anxiety, especially after COVID because the worst case scenario happened, right? Because with anxiety, it's an exaggerated perception of a threat, an exaggerated perception that something really horrible is gonna happen. And then unfortunately, something really horrible did happen. So a lot of people felt out of control. And when you feel out of control, that exacerbates your anxiety. So I see a lot of anxiety. I see a lot of social phobias. Um, Unfortunately, some people have a hard time now going into a grocery store or going to a friend's house and, or being in large gatherings. So we deal with that. I also see um, the youth dealing with depression. So feeling unmotivated. I hear a lot of sentences like, what's the point? Um, isolation, not being able to connect with friends, not being able to fit in. So things that we all <clears throat> have dealt with, but for some reason, for some people, they, it causes such a, a dysregulation that they need to seek treatment. Also, um, to your question, it's a very good question. I always get asked, um, 
How much can my mom know, for example? So I always tell them that what we have here is kind of like a um, doctor-patient confidentiality or like a lawyer and a client. Anything you tell me in this room stays completely between us unless you want to hurt yourself or someone else. So then I have to report you and then I have to tell your parents because that's a safety concern. But besides that, anything you tell me stays between us. And I do have parents sometimes ask me and I tell them, go ask your kid. If your child wants to tell you um, what we talked about, then they can. Besides that, I can't tell you. Now sometimes though, um, let's say there's a family issue and the youth um, is having a hard time expressing this issue to his parents. I'll ask them, would you like your mom to come into a session one day and we can, the three of us, discuss this um, so they have somebody kind of advocating for them. That we can do. Um, also, uh, when I see them in public, I always tell them this is the first session. If I see you in public, don't be surprised if I pretend I don't know you. Because, again, that's to ensure confidentiality. And I always tell them, don't, you know, don't feel bad if I ignore you because I'm respecting your boundaries and I'm respecting that you're my client. Now, if they come up to me and say hi, then I say hi and, you know, I speak to them normally. But I do, try, I do take my confidentiality very um, seriously and most therapists do as well. And um, in regards to the process of therapy, so the first session is um, called a psychosocial assessment session. So we kind of get to know each other. And finding a good therapist is like finding a good partner. You have to click. So I always tell my clients, if it doesn't click, I don't get offended, just tell me it's not working and it's completely fine. Just don't ghost me. So just let me know it's not working and I will discharge you. So we do a full assessment. I ask about history. I ask about your parents. I ask about your siblings. I ask about your upbringing, um, what you're studying, what your coping mechanisms are. And the reason I do that is because I create a detailed treatment plan specifically for your needs, because not everyone has the same needs. And then the second session, we go over the treatment plan. And what I personally do is something called a psychoeducation session which is um, I explain what your diagnosis is, I explain the treatment plan, and then I explain what you have. Because in psychology, there's a famous saying that says, if you can name it, then you can tame it. So in order for you to understand and work through your emotional dysregulation, you need to be able to name what you're having. So for example, if you say, okay, you know, if I tell myself, Malak, you have anxiety and you're having an anxious moment. That alone scientifically reduces your anxiety by 50%. This is what the research says. So that's why I do a full psychoeducation session. We go through what does it mean to have anxiety? What are the symptoms? Why do I feel this way? Where did it come from? So for them to understand, because you need to understand what you're feeling. I can't treat you if you don't understand. So um, we do that, and then after that, I let them take over. You come in, I just ask a basic question. How are you doing? And then they explain if they had an issue with a friend or their mother or their father or whatnot, and they kind of lead the session for me, and it can take up to six months. Some people I'm, I see for a year. It depends on their needs, but whenever you're ready to discharge, you just tell me and I discharge you. There's no, like, commitment. Um, yeah. I, I, that's a, <clears throat> an interesting point about the naming it because a lot of people think that naming something means you're, gonna, you're more likely to have it. So parents are afraid that if you label their children, for example, depressed or something, they're, yes. if they'll, you'll put the idea in their head, right? So, yes. uh, but you're saying it's the opposite. Yes, and also, um, Brother Ahmed, this falls back to us ignoring our feelings, right? Because when we're little, we're taught, just ignore it and it goes away. In my office, I tell them, you have to face it. So if you're feeling a certain way, ignoring it will never, ever go away. If anything, it, what I picture, honestly, is a huge cloud walking over you everywhere you go. And then you trying to go like this, to ignore the cloud. And it's getting bigger and bigger. But if you face it, I always say, face the feeling. What did you feel? Name it, face it. Give, give yourself that ver validation that, yes, I'm feeling sad right now. Yes, I'm feeling overwhelmed. So not ignoring it. Mm. It's like kind of a different way of approaching it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Saidna, uh, what, what do you think you can say to parents in terms of, in terms of seeking treatment for their children? Uh, you know, as we've been talking about, it's, it's something maybe that brings shame, not just to the children, obviously, but to the family. Sometimes we see uh, other families maybe, uh, you know, staying away from, from these, you know, if a family has someone with a mental illness, they might stay away from them. So what do you have to say to, to parents of these children? I tell them just be open-minded. And don't let those stigmas 
uh, discourage you from doing the right thing for your child. Your child deserves uh, treatment, medical treatment, therapy. And don't let stigmas and what other people say and what this Hajj says or that Hajj says uh, discourages you from doing the right thing. Our kids are a trust in our hand mm -hmm. and we have to do our best to take care of them. So when they are suffering from uh, paranoia, OCD, uh, depression, my responsibility as a father, as a mother, is to seek the best treatment for them. And I should not shy away because of the stigma. Don't worry about what people say. Worry about your child's life. Mm -hmm. Worry about doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. What people say about you is not going to change the reality in your life. If you're going to be miserable, you will be miserable no matter what you do. And people will say whatever they want to say. But only if you take the lead and try to change your life and your children's life, then you can bring a new positive change in, into their lives. But if you are waiting to see what people say and what people will judge, you're not getting anywhere. So the most important thing, my dear brothers and sisters, do not compromise over your children's well-being. Our children's well-being is priority in our life. And Allah will hold us accountable if we fall short, if we don't do the right thing, if we take them to the sheikh uh, on this village or that village, or I call a sheikh in the old country and ask him, how, you are not doing your kids any service, any service. Take your kids to therapist, take them to specialist, and don't worry what people say about your kids, whether uh, they will judge your, your uh, kids negatively or they look at them through negative lenses. Don't worry. Worry about the well-being of your children. That is what really matters. And that's how you will be judged, as a good father or a bad father as a good parent or a bad parent, and if I do the right thing, not to wait for people to tell me what to do and to please people. I'm not going to please people in the cost of my kids' well-being. Put the well-being of your children first. And this is exactly what Islam says. Parents have guardianship right over their kids as long as, as long as, they maintain their well-being. But the minute a father or a mother misjudges the well-being of their children and don't do what is right for their kids, their guardianship right is taken away from them, Islamically speaking. Sister Malak, can you talk about some maybe warning signs of uh, sometimes someone may feel sad or may feel... Um, you know, worried about something. When does it become, when does it get to a level where it's severe enough to, to maybe um, go to therapy? So, <clears throat> excuse me, I think um, before it gets severe enough, you should seek treatment because sometimes when it gets to a level where you cannot function anymore, I've noticed in my office, it takes a lot longer to get back to baseline. So before you feel that way, when you start to have symptoms, let's say, of depression, where you're feeling sadness and unmotivated, when you start having a hard time completing basic everyday functions, like getting up and showering, or going to work, or finishing your schoolwork, this is when you should seek counseling. You shouldn't seek counseling when you're basically bedridden with, with depression, because then you need medication and counseling, and there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of times I'll work with somebody for a while, and then we keep hitting a wall, because it's gotten to a point where it's really bad, and I'll tell them, now I need you to go get a consult from your medical doctor, and you might need medication along with what we're doing here today. And again, there's no shame in that. But some flags that come to my mind is when you feel overwhelmed with your emotions where you can't function and when things are changing. Like I always ask my clients, why are you coming to me now? Like what happened now to make you think I need 
treatment. And it's usually because they tell me I can't function anymore. This is the only thing I think about. I can't be with my family, I can't be with my kids, or I don't want to be in my house anymore. So that's one. Also, when your thoughts are too much. So your thoughts are so overwhelming that you can't think about anything else, where you worry so much that it becomes kind of obsessive compulsive style of thoughts. Um, also, just for, some people come to me for coping mechanisms, like I'm having a hard time at school, I need some tools to work through this. Grief is another one, uh, working through grief of the loss of a loved one or somebody that's sick and is dying is another reason. Um, so any of those things, and honestly, it doesn't even have to be a reason. Sometimes somebody will come see me just because they need help working through a certain situation and I'll see them for a little bit and then we discharge. So there's no shame in um, thinking, what if my problem isn't a big deal? This is what's stopping us. This is your own anxieties and this is your own thinking of what if she thinks it's not a big deal? There's no such thing as not a big deal. There's no checkoff list as, let's see if you're appropriate or not. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Sayyidna, uh, let's say somewhat, let's say the parents or, um, let's say the parents agree that there's a problem and, and they should seek therapy or that they need professional help. Can they trust people in, in you know, mental health, uh, you know, can they trust mental health professionals? Can, can they trust therapists or these institutions or, uh, you know, what, what's your view on this? Well, look, uh, therapists, doctors, specialists, like any other profession, there are some good ones and there are some not so good ones. Uh, and therefore, to say, should we trust the system? Yeah, of course we should trust the system. Should we trust the fact that when I am having depression, I need to seek medical uh, therapy? Yes, I should do that for sure, no doubt. Whether that doctor is the right person for me or another one, that's a different story. You need to look for the right doctor. Mm -hmm. Maybe sometime you end up with not so good doctor. Uh, so finding the right doctor who would prescribe, prescribe for you the right therapy and right medication is very important. Just like in any field in medicine, if you have an issue with your heart, you're not going to go to Hayyallah doctor. You're going to read the reviews and the doctor you're visiting to make sure he is highly qualified. And then you go and visit him and you allow him to conduct a, a surgery on you. <clears throat> Same thing with, uh, with the psychiatrist or someone you are seeking therapy, mental therapy with. But the fact remains that that is the only the only, to seek medical treatment is the only way out. And I always tell my friends that don't listen to what people say. Go do the right thing. In America, statistics say 20% of Americans experience depression. If you translate that percentage into numbers, that would be around 60 million. 60 million Americans have depression or somehow, sometime experience depression. Now, I hear sometimes people, especially immigrants, they say, Wallah, when we were in Iraq and Iran, we never heard of this. This is a, a phenomena that you just see in America. And that's not a true. You know why you didn't hear about it in Iraq and Afghanistan? Because people were mostly uneducated. They couldn't name things with their names. People with depression, they didn't know they had depression. Or if they knew they had depression, they didn't have the courage to go and seek treatment. Or maybe they didn't trust the doctors there or the medical institutions. But to say depression didn't exist before, or it does not exist in Muslim countries, that's a myth. That's a myth. So it is not a true. If in the U.S. 20% of the population suffer from depression, I bet you similar, similar percentage, if not more, exists in the Arab and Muslim countries. So 
Uh, in fact, I was reading uh, a, a, a report the other day, the other day about depression in Arab countries. They surveyed certain Arab countries, not all of them. Some, probably 10 Arab countries, Morocco, Tunisia, Lebanon, Egypt, Iraq. Guess what? 40% of Iraqis have depression. So to say we didn't hear about it, it didn't exist, I mean, that's a myth. Maybe you didn't hear about it. That doesn't mean it didn't exist. Go and seek therapy. And therapy is not, again, is not, find, uh, is not found uh, with a sheikh or a sayyid. There is another issue, another problem we face. People who go to those, I would call them imposters or crooks who would write certain things for them on a piece of paper and tell them, give them, and charge them some money, $200, $300, and tell them, take this, this uh, uh, paper and keep it with you and your depression will go away. Be careful, don't go to those people. Those people are interested in your money, in your cash. Mm -hmm. And they are basically uneducated. The fact that they charge you for writing a dua is a sign that you need to be careful. That raises a red flag. Because if, it's, if these people are honest and serious, they would not charge you. The fact that they are charging you money, you need to become suspicious about their intention and motivation and the, the whole rationale of going to them. We need to be very educated, open-minded about how we tackle our, our health issues. We should not follow fairy tales. We should not listen to some elderly people tell us, even though we have utmost respect for our elderly people. But our elderly people could be uneducated or they lived at the time where they would find simple remedy for uh, certain issues that no longer that works anymore. Be careful on how to handle, go to the right channel, go to the right doctor, and yes, we trust if a doctor is qualified, whether a man or a woman, and they are licensed, uh, go to them. Seek proper uh, medical treatment, and try to find. By the way, again, I'm not a doctor to tell you, but I know that certain problems, mental issues, it will take time, maybe six months, a year for you to see results. Some people go to the psychiatrist or psychologist, and after two weeks when they don't see any result, they say, uh, no, no, خلاص, we're, we, we, we're going to quit. It takes time, sometime with certain issues, especially depression and bipolar, it takes time for the medication to yield and to see a, a tangible result. So you need to be patient. Uh, some people tell you, um, when I took the antidepressant medications, all I did, I was dizzy, sleeping, and it made me more crazy. Have you heard that? Have you heard that? I have heard that. Catatonic, yeah. That's not a true. That's not a true. You need to be patient. Well, maybe it makes you sleepy as a side effect, but to make you more crazy, that's not a true. Unless you didn't go to the doctor, to the right doctor. You may have went to someone who is not specialized in, in that field. So, and he, you ended up with the wrong medication. But if you seek the right doctor and the right the doctor would prescribe for you the right right uh, medication now all these scientific findings indicate that you have a high probability of healing and coming out of that hole so uh, you need not to be uh, discouraged one time a person i finish answering this question by telling you that one time a man came to me and he wanted me to write dua for his son who had severe depression. So I told him to seek therapy, medical therapy, and the father says, no, 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 we're not going to. I said, why? 
He said, if we seek medical therapy, my son will lose his job. I'm not sure if that's true, but let's say that's true. Which one is more important, your well-being or your job? Your job, you can find another job anytime you want. But if you lose your health and you compromise over your well-being, there is nothing that compensates for it. So it's okay, let him lose his job. But at least he earns his, his uh, health back. So even if that is the situation, assuming that if I seek medical therapy, I will lose my job, let it be. Go and seek therapy. You will feel better and you eventually will heal. Asantam, Sayyidina. And uh, just to follow up on what you were saying, Sayyidina, it's... Uh in a lot of, in our countries we've obviously ex experienced a lot of unrest and wars and you know things like that so there's a lot of trauma that can come from that so maybe even the cases of trauma and post traumatic stress disorder and these things maybe are even higher in our in our countries um, that's very true that's another fact that uh, increases the risk of getting depression and and other mental uh, illnesses santum uh, sidna uh, Sister Malak, uh, to follow up maybe on this point as well with uh, the Sayyid was talking about uh, trusting the, the system and, and uh, but how, how can you find the right therapist? What, what process would you suggest uh, to finding the right therapist? Is, is the background important? You know, those kinds of things. I think background is important for if you're looking for a certain specialty, for example. Um, also, a, just a general way of finding a therapist, uh, you can just go to like psychologytoday.com and you can filter the search based on um, language, religion, um, zip code, whatnot, if you're looking for a specific therapist. I do encourage our young adults to look for somebody that's within the same culture as you are, only because I've heard s horrific stories about people seeing a therapist and the therapist convincing them, for example, to set boundaries for their parents and like leave the house, for example. Um, if your mom is giving you a hard time, then don't talk to your mom anymore, right? This is, this is something that a lot of therapists practice, setting boundaries, which is, which is very important. I work on setting boundaries as well. But I do take into consideration what the client wants or what their background is. Like if they are Muslim from a Muslim family, if they are even just um, Arab and Christian, for example. So I always ask the client, um, what was your family life like? What's your background like? Would you like to incorporate your religion into this um, session? Because sometimes therapists that are unaware of your cultural background are not going to understand the little things our parents do or our spouses do or our friends do or how our culture is. Um, so I think that is very important um, for us to consider. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, maybe we can end with uh, one more one more question for uh, Sayyidna. We, we've talked about you know a lot of a lot of things today in terms of the, the culture and and how uh, how that affects us. Is there you know what, where can we find uh, uh, what, what role can culture play basically? You know so so does culture have have room uh, in, in our societies in terms of you know if you want to be religiously observant, what role can culture play in that or or how can it fit into that? Well, no doubt uh, that uh, culture plays a major role in, in making up part of our uh, personality. Uh, one one uh, uh, main factor in our life that uh, contributes to building uh, our, our personality is, is culture. And we cannot detach ourselves from our, our culture. In the end, we human beings uh, are byproduct of our societies, our communities. And no matter what, eventually we will be shaped by the norms and traditions and the culture we were raised in. But the point we were trying, I was trying to make is, uh, don't take cultures as seriously as religion. Meaning, if you go against a certain culture for one reason, either because you change geography or it is a different time, it's okay, let it be. A following the tradition and the culture 
it's not something that I take as serious as, as uh, uh, religion. The one who created religion is God. The one who created culture is another human being like me. So what does make him uh, superior over me that I have to follow him? I have to follow God because he's my creator. But do I have to follow another human being who created certain traditions and I find myself obliged to follow them? No. So following the culture is a, is a matter of choice. I can choose follow this tradition, this culture, or not. And if I go against the uh, culture, the prevalent culture, the consequences are not as severe as going against God. So we always need to see where I am at. If it's something related to religion, to God, that's a red line for me. But when it comes to tradition, and especially when my tradition, my culture conflicts science, and what scientists say, so what? I'm going to follow science, and I'm not going to, going to follow culture, my culture. If my science says, do something, do the surgery, my culture says, don't do the surgery, rather take this cream. I'm not going to use this cream to save my life just because I wanted to follow the culture. I'm going to do what science says because I want to preserve my life. So the bottom line is religion, science, we take them seriously. And they hardly at all, religion and science. But a lot of time we find culture and religion are at odd. Culture and science are at odd. And in this time, I'm not obligated to follow culture. Rather, I need to follow what is best for me, which is following God and science. Ahsantum Sayyidina. Uh, Sister Malak, if someone wants to work with you uh, directly, how can, they, how can they find you? Um, I have my business cards with me. <laughs> also, I'm found on Psychology Today. If you just look up my name, I have an Instagram page also. It's called Internal Healing Services. I just post, um, you know, just helpful information. I'm located, my office is located in the downtown Dearborn area, kind of next to Kahwa House. And um, yeah, if you feel like you can benefit from working with me, I'd love to hear your story. And just give me a call. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Saidna, for being with us today and honoring us. And uh, thank you. Well, Sister you know where to find me. I'm here at <laughs> IIA. But if you come to me with psychiatrist issue, I'm not going to. Send them to me, Sayed. I can send you, <laughs> the, you to Sister Malak or the doctor across the street from us. And just come to me when you have a religious issue. I don't interpret dreams, by the way. <laughs> I don't uh, prescribe uh, any uh, remedy for uh, any psychiatric problems and I have no magic uh, solutions for many issues people have and finally uh, some people are coming to me seeking jobs so I'm not a good <laughs> employer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Sister Malek, as Thank well, for being for with us. Me. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And uh, loud salawat, please, first. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad.